Hello, and welcome to this episode of Quaker Up. Now, I've been thinking, well, what, should, what can I do an episode about? I want it to be deep and spiritual and meaningful and all this sort of stuff. And my brain was giving me nothing. So I've decided to talk about something that I'm really interested about that isn't Quakerism and blend it with Quakerism. And that is The Lord of the Rings. And I thought it's my channel talk about what I want. So I'm going to be talk, talk, so my idea is I'm going to be blending these two things, kind of looking at the Lords of the Rings and looking at what are the Quaker takes in that movie that maybe might resonate with my Quaker Lord of the Rings fan self. Now I know, I understand that J.R.R. Tolkien was not a Quaker. He was a, a, a full-on Catholic, like you can't get more Catholic than J.R.R. Tolkien was, and I respect that. Um, but I think quite a lot of the quite a lot of the a lot of messages that come out of that do have a Quaker tint to it as well. And I've done a whole video on the links between Quakerism and Catholicism. I think they link in lovely and uh, unexpected ways. And I think maybe in a character in particular, uh, Catholicism and um, Quakerism intertwine in a lovely way, which we'll come to in a minute. They also understand that when initially looking at uh, the books and the films of the Lord of the Rings, it doesn't seem a particularly Quaker movie or book at all. You know that it's all about a massive war. There's a there's a lot of violence going on. You know, there's it's all about the armies and the cavalry charges and um, how brave the Fellowship are in chopping off orcs' heads and hitting them with spat pans and all that sort of stuff. But I think under, underneath that, there is a Quaker tint that I am drawing out into this video um, just to give another angle that perhaps isn't looked at in, Qua in, in The Lord of the Rings too much or in Quakerism too much and just, just bring them together delightfully. But anyone who's mad enough not to have read Lord of the Rings or seen the, movie, or, or seen the films, you know, whatever, whatever, you, they're, they're both good. They're both good, different but good. Um, it is set in a mythological world of Middle Earth, where a um, band of um, a nine companions set off in order to destroy a magical evil ring um, that is being looked for by a Dark Lord. If he gets the ring, the end of the world is here. If um, the nine companions are able to destroy the ring, then, you know, good wins and all is well. Now, if I were to say... It, so obviously in Lord of the Rings, it's, a, it's, it was the, it's the quintessential fantasy book, film. And so there are obviously fantastical races. So there are men, obviously, or humans, as we might want to call them in today's modern culture. Um, but there are also elves, dwarves, and hobbits. And what I would say is, I think if I were to say that the Quakers were any of these, I would say they were definitely hobbits. And I mean that in the most in the, in the most positive way. Now they are known that well, so first off, they're they're small people, which is not so great, but uh they have a history of being a bit isolationist, as the Quakers have a bit of history of being a bit isolationist. Um they are try they live a simple life so they they're not getting involved in all the all like high politics and all this sort of stuff they they like to farm have fireworks and that's that's and and drink beer which and and smoke not necessarily all quaker values but you know i think if 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 we're being gen generic i think hobbits are the where are where quakers are, are where quakers would feel most at home they also don't really participate in any form of battles or war you know they they are just getting on with their lives getting keeping out of it you know they they're not necessarily you know against violence in the in the quaker way but they are not known for their military prowess shall we say and stick stay away from that and stick to gardening and it is these people, so it is for, it's, um, these hobbits that uh, from 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 whence come the f uh, four of the nine companions that I mentioned earlier: Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin. And they and it is them, uh, arguably, who are the main heroes, I suppose. So Frodo is the carrier of the ring, the ring bearer. Uh, Sam is his loyal companion, and Frodo and uh, Merry and Pippin get up to all sorts of japes and basically help lead the other other people into doing the right thing eventually, sort of. So they are ultimately the ones who are, especially Frodo, is the one that's carrying this evil burden upon himself um, at great personal cost. Um, 
supported by faithful friends uh, and, and eventually destroys evil and um, saves the day, which is very Quaker behavior, I, I should say. But how did this all come about? How did it, how was it decided that it would be Frodo that would be taking on this horrible burden? Well, he has his own version of a, a clear, meet, meeting for clearness uh, in the form of the Council of Elrond, which is a massive, basically, meeting for worship with talking and lots of lots of other lads going on but basically comes frodo comes to the conclusion in that meeting in that meeting at the beginning of the meeting he's like i'm getting out of here i'm going back home it sounds amazing um this sounds very horrible and what um, elrond is asking us to do with this ring take to this horrible place with volcanoes and um uh, evil orcs everywhere i'd rather just go home actually and by the end of the meeting he's decided yeah i'm going which seems very quakerly um i suppose you could argue that sounds like maybe any um mystical meeting but i think it does you know i you know they're all sitting in a circle um there isn't much silence but i think it's quite a, like a quaker meeting for worship in a way especially in terms of the change of decision uh from the main character there from yeah i'm going out to say no it's the right thing these people are all useless they don't know what they're doing i'll do it uh, because i'm above uh, their petty squabbling because i can see that good needs to be done very quaker if i'm really looking at it though and thinking which character best sort of sums up quakerism or certainly has the best quakerish quotes it would certainly be the kind of character of gandalf now gandalf is a he's well it's not really ever explained in the books or the films quite what he is he's certainly someone who is not human he is supernatural um he uh, is certainly uh, for tolkien a, a christ-like figure he dies and comes back from the dead and um, so there's lots of um uh, similarities between um uh, Jesus and Gandalf, and that's been covered an awful lot. So I'm not going to go into that. There's better, better people who can talk about that. But I think there is no one better, maybe, well, maybe, to talk about how he is a Quaker or a Quaker figure. What is interesting as well is that because he dies, he come, he starts off as Gandalf the Grey, who's very sort of, I'd say, very Quaker. You know, he's very sort of simple in his barb, and you know, he has a long beard and a big hat, and um keeps to the shadows more is is uh, but then when he dies and comes back he comes back as sort of like a resurgent um all conquering gandalf the white warrior but i think at both times he is more, he's more quaker when he's gandalf the gray that goes without saying i think he's more quaker when he's there but there i think he is still a quaker when he's gandalf the white as well and they kind of go into that in a bit more detail as well so i was watching it recently as i often do and i was just and i was just and, and, I, and, and i was just thinking of all the times that there was a quaker quote that i could make use for this video and they were pretty much all from gandalf um and so i've got a couple here and kind of just think about what that says about quakerism and yeah so let's go so how does the character of gandalf show his his quaker elements maybe um well although the both Gandalf the Grey and Gandalf the White are quite violent. I think he quite often chooses not to use violence. He is especially Gandalf the Grey. Maybe Gandalf the White not so much. But um, and, and he only uses it in you know the for good. You know he never uses violence to punish. I mean he does grab Sam out of a window and quite roughly throw him onto the table. But I mean like you know fair enough. He was eavesdropping, wasn't he? So he, so fine. Um, so he does. So for example, probably the ultimate scene where Gandalf is at his most Quaker is where he is confronting the Balrog. Now the Balrog is uh, basically an evil demon from a time long past and they're fighting in a mine and uh, it's all very fantasy. You can't get really more fantasy than that. And you know, anyone who's read lots of fantasy and not read Lords of the Rings or seen Lords of the Rings, they might think, oh, there's going to be an epic battle going to be here. He's going to get out his sword. Indeed he does. I think, yeah, and uh, there's there's going to be like lots of oh, bring it on, and he just doesn't. He doesn't. He stands fast and basically tells the Balrog to go away. He says, "You shall not pass." Fav is the famous line. Um, 
so choosing nonviolence over uh, you know when they when you know maybe uh, m- more modern fancy writers might have just had like an awesome like all out fight he chooses not and he just like slams his staff on the ground and it's all very it's all very mellow compared to like the balrog who's like all fire and like there's he's got like this whip and it's it's all very he's all very like powerful and he's just there like this old like gray man and, and uh, doesn't choose to fight and in that he also says which i think is probably the most quaker quote which we'll look at now which is um as he's sort of giving his credentials to the to the balrog as to don't mess with me but i'm not gonna fight you but don't mess with me so he says i am the servant of the secret fire wielder of the flame of arnor now to be honest i don't think this makes much sense in it makes sense in the wider world building of tolkien's mythology but it doesn't make much catholic sense i feel i don't think if a catholic was going to pick pick like the best catholic quotes from um from gandalf i don't think they'd pick this one out necessarily um however this is a super quaker quote i mean the secret fire i mean i don't think that i don't think any quaker has called the inner light that but i think it's a great name for the for the inner light um the secret fire oh and um wielder of the flame of anor anor just means sun in elvish so but you know so I, I like the secret fire very much and he uses that in order to confront evil in a non-violent way it's so quaker and also there's demons and and arrows going off anywhere which is not so quaker but makes it quite cool you know if you're going to appeal to quakerism for quakerism to the wider masses this is quite a cool way to do it so a quote that you could maybe use to talk about um gandalf's non-violence and as i said i use that you know liberally um because obviously there that he does hack an awful lot of orcs so you know but um if um if you're going to talk, talk about that so again in the mines is most quaker in, in the mines um he's talking to frodo about this evil um follower well not follower in the in the company in the company but like someone who's like sneaking behind them called Gollum, and um he hears well he knows that his uncle tried and nearly could had the opportunity to kill Gollum in the past but didn't and he's like oh god i wish my uncle had killed him and gandalf comes in and says um he says it's a pity that Gan- that that my my uncle didn't kill him and he says pity it was pity that stayed his hand and uh, pity and mercy um uh, and i think that's obviously a very it's you know saying that T- you know turning what was you know quite a quite a violent statement on on um on frodo's on frodo's part into well actually no that's quite that's the exact reason why he didn't do it because he he had pity for this you know loathsome creature um and didn't kill him and uh, by so doing ultimately spoiler alert it is Gollum who through lots of malarkey is um is the is the cause of the ring ultimately being destroyed and goodness being created so um the the looking into the future to see that um uh, that not being not not taking matters in your own hands and thinking you know everything um and thinking that violence is always always the answer even when it seems logical that it is that it's not that it could also not be i think it's quite a quaker message as well so we then come to gandalf the white so again the although he does a great job with um with uh, against the balrog he does ultimately die uh he kills the balrog as well in fairness so that's nice um but he dies but he comes back happy days but this time he's getting off the way and as i said he's a lot more um um triumphant than um uh than gandalf the gray less humble so i suppose less, less quaker in that regard um but one of his um uh, his first lines when he re-emerges is that he says i come back to you now at the turn of the tide which i kind of think is a, it could be quite i could um quite a early quaker quote maybe um you know they were living in a time when they really thought the world was coming to end and uh, coming uh, coming to an end and that they were there at the last to try and fight the last fight and get you hum- get and um, get humanity on 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 the right track for because christ had come and all that sort of stuff judgment day was judgment day was near so the turn of the tide and we are there as quakers i could see george fox saying that easily 
there's a simile as well so when when it's starting to get going and you know battle is starting to commence he says um we come to it at last the great battle of our time again you know th that you know this is uh, that Quakers live in the present and especially early Quakers looking at how um, they thought that the end really was nigh and this really was the last big battle and we've got to show up and be as best as we can be. Um, but I suppose nowadays, even even also just saying that, you know, the fight is now, you know, that there are, we, there is, we can't just sit on past laurels. We can't just say, oh, well, you know, someone else will deal with it. No, we have to deal with it. We need to be there. Uh, we need to be at the forefront of it right now. So the sort of sense of urgency and um, combat. I mean, you know, Quakers, although yes, have held a long, a, a long in holding to a peace testimony, um, but the using um, the symbology of war to and talking about the Lamb's War and stuff is still very is very prevalent in in, in Quaker um, in Quaker speech Quaker speech. And so, if we take that as a metaphorical message, in the same way that the Lamb's War is taken as a metaphorical message, I think fighting against the evil of our time, I think, is uh, is very much what Quakers are about and what Quakers are doing. One thing that I think Gandalf the White does very well is that he he's all about light. So um, obviously, instant connections to Quakerism there. So you see him like fighting off like evil, e evil fell beasts with light shining out from him. All very Quaker and great. Um, that's how I like to see myself fighting off evil spirits. So a nice bit of exorcism. Going back to my Halloween video there. Um, lovely. I think probably, however, my the, my favourite quote from Gandalf the White is quite simply where where he's get it, he's managing to get the kingdoms of men all together by lighting beacons. And um, when he sees the first one lit, even though no one really wanted to do it, he managed to get it to happen. And he says, "Hope is kindled," which I think is a lovely and very uh, provocative Quaker quote. That is quite nice, you know. Again, linking to light with kindling and um, that that sort of um, small fire that you know you have to protect and build up and that is our responsibility to look after that and that ultimately that we're hopeful that we're not um we're not thinking that all is doom and gloom and that we're all destined to hell and we're sinful horrible people and all that that you know that we have a more positive um worldview than that and i think that is quite nicely summed up in that quote i suppose that's a final point um a lot of what the Lord of the Rings is trying to do is to show um, the battle of good and evil. You know, sort of, sort of, as, I, as I was saying earlier, spiritual warfare. You know, yes, this is actually taking place and people are actually fighting and there are these hideous beasts and orcs that people are fighting that represent the forces of evil. But if we kind of look at that more metaphor metaphorically and look at that as a, um, as a, as a spiritual fight, both um, in the world, but also within ourselves, you know, as well. And that that is um, that there are these forces that are, a, looking for um um you know looking to get us closer to closer to, um to, to the divine and there are those that are trying to pull us away and in the wider world the same and i think it, things like the lord of the rings put that into a very a very stark metaphor and i think these sort of inspiring um characters and these messages are there as a sort of way as a prop to support people in that spiritual journey and in that spiritual warfare if you want to see it like that and i think the lord of the rings shows that really well in a way that as an aside i don't think modern fantasy necessarily does because i think what modern fantasy has taken on is oh yeah let's talk about orcs and fighting and stuff and that's cool and you know sure yeah, that that's that might be a cup of tea but it doesn't have that that sort of deeper spiritual meaning and i think that's what a lot of what modern fantasy is lacking it's gone completely down you know the gratuitous violence and um and uh looking at it as, as a solely human endeavor instead of looking at it as a more spiritual thing um and you know for for better well you know for better or for worse i suppose so there you go that was me that was me doing my best to try and link two very important passions of mine um what what do you think are there are there things i've missed i'd be mortified if there are things i miss but also really cool if you've got some really cool like quotes quaker, quaker lord of the rings quotes that you think are, that you think are cool what um if you were to think of a film that isn't like 
a Quaker film. Is there a Quaker film? You get what I mean. Um, that isn't, you know, so is there a film which you think has hidden Quaker messages in it, even though they might not have been originally intended? Let me know. I might do another one if I know the film and like it. Um, anyway, but uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll see each other again soon. Thank you very much for watching the video. If you liked it, please do click on the thumbs up and the subscribe button to get more videos about Quakerism in the UK today. It really does help and thanks once again.